Now listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Hello. Yes, hello. It's Tom Berlinson calling from Cleanit Vacuum Cleaners. Mr. Sergeant, is it? Yes. I understand you recently purchased a vacuum from us. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. Well, this is simply a call to find out if you've been happy with your purchase. Our company prides itself on its after-sales service. Just because you've bought from us doesn't mean you're no longer important to us. Could you spare a few moments to answer some questions? Sure. How long will this take? Well, not long at all, Mr. Sergeant. Usually only about three or four minutes. Okay. What would you like to know? Okay, great. I'll just go through the survey form, and、uh, if you'll just bear with me, this shouldn't take long at all. Uh, okay. First question: Which model did you purchase, and when? Yes, it was the Super Cleaner. We bought it about two weeks ago.、Uh, see, it was a Monday, I think, because my wife's birthday was on the Sunday, twenty fourth.、Uh, that would make it the twenty fifth. Yes, August the twenty fifth. Okay. Now, do you remember the name of the salesperson? Was he worth remembering? Yes, his name was Jim. My wife and I were very impressed with him. He was a great source of information, very helpful. Great. I'll make sure that your kind words about Jim are passed on to him. Okay. Now let's see. Ah, yes. Have you purchased any other products from us this year? Oh, let's see.、Uh, of course, we bought the super cleaner. I think that's all. Well, we bought some vacuum bags with it as well.、Um, uh, I think Daisy bought some carpet cleaner from your store back in February. That's about all I think. I have to ask my wife about that one. She's not here at the moment. No, no, that's okay. Your answer will do fine. We don't have to be too picky. Okay, so how much money would you say you've spent all told in the store? Just an approximate amount will do fine. Wow, that's a difficult question.、Uh, I don't really know. the The vacuum was 150 pounds. The other stuff, I'd say around 15 pounds. I suppose the total was around 165 pounds. But I couldn't be totally sure. It may be a bit more than that. That's fine. That's fine. Now. The next thing on my list is how would you rate the quality of the products you purchased? Good, actually, very good. So far, we've not had any problems with the products from Cleanit. Service and value have been very good. So I guess you have a loyal customer. Oh, <laughs> wonderful! I'm really pleased that your experience with our company has been a positive one. Tell me, do you purchase any other items of cleaning equipment? If so, from whom? I'm very fussy about the interior of my car, you know. The seats and carpets. I found a product from Easy Clean which works well on the carpets, and an air freshener from Mr. Tidy that really smells good. Apart from that, oh, I couldn't say for sure. I think my wife buys floor cleaner from Johnson Brothers. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions six to ten. Now listen and answer questions six to ten. Well, we've just introduced a new line of car fresheners. You might like to stop by. We'll offer you a twenty percent discount. Okay, we're almost to the end of the questions. Now I know you are happy with Jim, but overall, how would you rate the quality of our service? Fine. I thought it was good. The lady in accounts was a little unfriendly, but overall, I would say the service was quite good. Actually, Jim made all the difference, and you certainly seem to be a very nice person. Oh, thanks, Mr. Sergeant. Please,、uh, Tom, call me Terry. Oh, okay, Terry. Very good. Second last question: We're thinking of expanding our trading hours. When are the best times? The most convenient for you to shop? Oh, I'm not a shopper. I mostly leave it all up to my wife. She works full time. Let's see. For me, I guess I'd have to say Sundays between one and three, and、uh, I'm not working on Thursdays now. So if I had to, I guess Thursdays between say eleven and twelve noon. Okay. Last question, Mr. Sergeant Terry. Do you have any other suggestions for us? Anything at all? Well, come to think of it, now there was one thing: turn up the air conditioner. 
I seem to remember sweltering in there, and it was unpleasant and hot. Also, and this is just me, I always like to have some music playing, you know, quietly in the background. It just makes the place seem friendlier, you know, more professional. Well, I'll certainly mention that to management. Well, that's it. Thanks so much for your time, Terry. If there is anything we can do in the future to help you, don't hesitate to call us. OK, bye now. Yes, bye-bye, and thanks again. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You are going to listen to two students talking about a presentation on time management. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Hi, Mark. What are you doing? Hi, Lucy. Well, I, I'm preparing this seminar on time management. I'm supposed to do a presentation on the topic next week. Ironic, isn't it? I'm probably the worst student when it comes to time management. I don't think you're that bad compared to some other people I know. Do you need some help with it? Yeah. I just don't know where to start, to be honest. When are you doing the presentation? I'm supposed to hand in the draft on Wednesday at 11 a.m. The presentation is scheduled for 10 a.m. this Friday. That's not too bad. This gives you the whole weekend to prepare. Let's brainstorm some ideas, shall we? Do you want to get a pen and paper to jot down some thoughts? I think you should start with a broad general statement. For example, I read somewhere that organising time is a skill like learning to drive or tying your shoelaces. Then you could move on to discussing the common problems people have with managing time. That's not a bad idea. One of the common problems is putting things off. Yeah, you could also mention some common signs of this symptom such as last-minute holiday shopping, pulling off visits to the doctors or the dentists. Another problem is relying too much on your memory and not writing things down. Do you mean not keeping a diary or a planner to plan the tasks? That's right. For example, writing down what I need to do in a diary or a planner helps me remember what I need to do and makes me more focused on the tasks for the day. Good idea! Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. That reminds me of something I've been meaning to do for a while now. Anyway, I should also include some advice on how to deal with the problem, shouldn't I? Sure, you can talk about some ways of stopping procrastination. I guess making a to-do list can help one focus on what needs to be done. Definitely. 
Another way to deal with the problem is to prioritise and do the hardest job first, the one which requires the most effort and concentration. Also, my tutor recommended that I should break big projects into small parts with a specific goal. Having an action plan has worked for me. I usually make a list of small tasks I need to do to achieve a goal. Sometimes I just don't feel like getting down to work because a task seems too overwhelming for me to even think about. This technique helps me reduce psychological pressure. If I think of a project as a set of easily achievable tasks, don't you think? I know what you mean. I often feel like that myself with the statistics project I've been doing this term. I'm well behind, and the deadline is next week. I think setting deadlines and sticking to them can help one to achieve goals. You can discuss this aspect in your presentation too. A good point. Setting deadlines can also help one become more realistic about the time it takes to do tasks. Another point you could include is how to deal with interruptions. Okay, I guess blocking in time to handle unpredictable interruptions can help one stay focused. Not just that, some interruptions, such as phone calls, can be easily avoided by using answering machines, for example. Saying no. Which is one of the most useful words in English is also very effective. It can be tough sometimes, but you've got to learn to say it nicely but firmly. I think you've got enough ideas here to start with. Definitely. Thanks a lot for your help. I just need to type the ideas up, and I think I'm all set. Do you think you can lend me your laptop for a couple of hours? Hmm. I'm afraid I can't. I've got to finish my own project. Never mind. I'll use one at the library. You certainly know how to say no. <laughs> Learned it the hard way. Got to go now. Good luck with the presentation. Cheers. See you later. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a female and a male student talking about the mock exams that they have just taken. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-five. So, what did you think of the practice exams last week? You mean the mock exams? Yeah, I thought some of them were tough. They were certainly hard, and generally they were very long. Yeah, they were spread over a whole week, which made it impossible to relax. Exactly, but what did you think of each test? Of the seven exams we did. The least enjoyable for me were the two three-hour essay papers. Why didn't you like the essay papers? I'm not particularly good at writing things down like that in a short space of time, and I don't think it's a good way of testing our theoretical knowledge of medicine. I'm the opposite. I'm afraid, I'm much better in the written essay exams than the other types of tests. But what about the two multiple-choice exam papers in basic science and anatomy? They weren't too bad. If you didn't know the answer, all you had to do was guess.、Mm, that's okay, but I never feel comfortable with guessing. And you know that there is research that shows that women 
are disadvantaged when doing multiple choice questions compared to men. You've mentioned this before, but I'm not sure I believe it. It's true. Multiple choice questions benefit men more than women. They are a male construct. If you say so. It's not if I say so. Anyway, you have to be careful with multiple choice questions because of the negative marking. That can really bring the score down if you keep guessing and get all of the guesses wrong. It's double negative. Yeah, that is a danger. What about the role play? Did you like that? Yeah, with the actors and actresses as simulated patients. Yeah, I thought that was by far the best part of the exam. Why was that? What I liked about it was during the 24 test stations, we had a chance to show what we know about communicating with patients and show our practical medical knowledge, etc. Yes, I think I agree with you there. I enjoyed all of the stations, but I can tell you I was tired at the end. I have done a practice exam with 12 test stations, but not 24. It was exhausting, but also exhilarating. I agree completely. It lasted nearly four hours in total with the break. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen carefully and answer questions 26 to 30. What did you think of the other two exams? The two problem-solving tests? Hmm, I didn't think I was going to handle them very well. But in the end, I think they went better than I thought they would. What I liked most was the test where we had to work in groups of four and to solve a problem, we had to prioritise actions. That was very interesting. I'm not sure I did very well in that, though. Did you feel comfortable being in a group of four and having four examiners watching you as you discussed the problem? We did practice it several times before. You learn to forget that someone is watching you. But some people are better at speaking in group situations like that and they get the best marks. The test doesn't just assess whether people can talk a lot. It's about showing you can listen organize your thoughts, and then show you can be part of a team, allowing other people to speak. Well, we'll have to see how it goes. When do the results of the mocks come out? They said next week, and then it's the finals two weeks later. Yeah, we've got that to look forward to. What is the policy on resets? Why? Are you planning to fail? No, but, well, you know what I mean. The resets are held in September, and if there is any problem after that... It goes to appeal. We'll just have to make sure we don't fail any part of the whole examination. I certainly wouldn't want to do any of it again. Me neither. It's hard when you are not allowed to fail any of the exams. I bet they don't have that policy in any other subject. Probably not. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecturer talking about the process of fossilization. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. The foremost exhibition in any great natural history museum is almost invariably a skeleton of a large dinosaur, often the famous Tyrannosaurus rex or T-Rex as it's usually known. Thus, one would think that these skeletons are plentiful, one for each museum, and more to spare in the basement. Well, here's an interesting fact. Almost every one of those T-Rex skeletons are just copies of the original fossils, and we only have 20 sets of these in the whole world. And the most complete is still missing one-fifth of its bones, and the rest are missing a lot more. And given that these dinosaurs once numbered in the thousands, and existed on this earth for perhaps three million years, you can realize an obvious fact. Fossilization is actually an extremely rare occurrence. Fossilization can only occur when, after an animal dies, it is buried in soft mud or silt relatively quickly, before the body completely rots or is torn to pieces by scavengers. Given this fact, the overwhelming majority of fossils are in marine sediment, where former marine life sank to the sea bottom, where sediment was being continually deposited. This means that we have a fairly good idea of the life in Earth's ancient oceans, but a much sketchier view of the land-based life forms. Fossilization on land needs water and mud, meaning that it is most often near ancient river sites and lakes but it is still so rare that there are, in fact, large stretches of geological time about which we don't quite know what was happening at all. So, given that fossilization is so rare, the natural question is, what can increase its odds? Well, fossilization mostly occurs with organisms which meet three basic criteria. One, they must have hard body parts, for example, shells, plates, bones and teeth. Unfortunately, the soft parts just rot away far too quickly to be fossilized. And I say unfortunately because it is often the soft fleshy features that most interest us. An elephant's trunk, for example, would not fossilize and from the skeleton alone we would never know the trunk was there. The second criterion for more likely fossilization is that the organism in question must have existed in considerable numbers and be spread over a wide geographical range. This simply increases the statistical probability that one of them will one day be fossilized and hopefully found. Finally, and by the same logic, the species needs to have existed on the earth for a long time and the longer the better. So, these are the three main criteria, but there are others. Being a large size, for example, helps us to notice and discover them as fossils more easily. And being a marine organism, as mentioned, helps also. Trilobites, a strange sort of ancient crab, are a perfect example. Their body structure was one of hard plates. They existed over virtually the whole world of their time and over a huge span of geological history, over 250 million years in fact one of the longest ranges of any creature ever. Added to this, some species could grow to relatively large sizes and they lived in the sea. Perfect! These creatures meet all the criteria and as a result, museums all over the world are spilling over with trilobite fossils of all shapes and sizes. As far as fossils go, they are common. So, let's think about T-Rex once again. It too basically meets all the criteria that we mentioned. It has hard parts, being the bones, had some dispersion, and had been around for a long time, although it cannot compare to trilobites in this respect. However, it does have one important advantage over trilobites. It is large, very large, which means we can discover it far more easily than many other fossils. And here's another advantage. Dinosaur hunters are a dedicated and fanatical breed, continually at work in all the likely sites of the world. Basically, us human beings are fascinated by these creatures. So much that we are always searching for them, probably more than any other types of fossil, meaning that more T-Rexes will inevitably spring up in the future, and one is certainly glad for this.
That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.